Hi, and welcome to Printing and Playing. Today we're going to be talking about Tiny Epic Kingdoms. Tiny Epic Kingdoms is a game for two to four players, which is sort of a mix of territory grabbing and resource management. This is, like other games I've mentioned in previous episodes, a game that is actually a print and play version of a commercial product. In this case, it is not exactly the same game. The commercial product has a little bit nicer artwork, comes with uh, a few extra uh, factions, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and it, the play is slightly different. Also, it's two to five players in the commercial version instead of two to four. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the game and how it works. In Tiny Epic Kingdoms, each player controls a different faction, or what you might call a race. In the print and play version, there are four to choose from. There are humans, elves, orcs, and also dwarves. Also, each player is given a territory card randomly, along with a town card that is used to track resources. The goal of the game is to be the player with the most points at the end of the game, and the game actually has a number of ways to score points, most of which revolve around gaining resources and then doing your best to use those resources in order to gain points throughout the course of the game. There are three types of resources in the game. Mana, which is represented by green, ore, which is represented by red, and food, which is represented by yellow. Each of these resources can be taken from the land from the matching color on the map when you place people there. Now most of the game revolves around this action selection card. Each turn the players will pick one action off of this card which they must then perform or do nothing and all the other players around the table have your choice of doing one action or picking up resources from where they have people out on the land. Now the resources are kept track of on the town cards with, one, with each cube representing that type of resource. So for example with food, if they have a total of five food in their stores, this would be moved up to five. So it's not an individual cube for each one. We're just using this as a score track to keep track of how many we have. Okay, so let's take a moment to go through the actions and just as a note, when an action is selected, one of these cubes is placed on that spot and that action cannot be taken again until the board has been filled up. Once the board has been filled up, the cubes are removed and all the actions are available again. Now the actions that can be taken is trade, which means you can trade one resource that you have for another, or you can expand, meaning you can add a population cube to the board, and it says pay food, and what that means is that the cost varies depending on how many people you already have out on the board. So if you have two, pe two people already out and you're adding a third, that costs three food. If you have four out on the board and you're adding a fifth, that costs five food and so on. The next action we have available is research and that is learn your magic and pay mana per the level. And for that we need to take a moment to take a look at the faction card. So for the example of humans here, what we're talking about is you can spend mana to go up this track here as far as magic and each race has its unique bonuses that it gets as you go up this level. For example, if you take the first level, which would cost one mana, their bonus is that instead of taking a research action, they can trade instead. When they pay two mana to get to level two, if they get a trade action, they get an extra resource. 
And you have to go up step by step. You can't, for example, immediately pay three mana and jump all the way up to three. You have to do one, then two, then three, and so on. And eventually, at the end of the game, this will help you score because at the top level of each of these, there's usually a bonus towards your end scoring. Or this one says that for each resource that you have over or equal to four units of, gain an extra point. Took me a second to read that. <laughs> But that's what you're looking at with mana, is going up that magic uh, level there. This will give you bonus points at the end, like I mentioned, at your top level. Also, at the end of the game, the level that you're at will score that many points for end scoring. So if you have me make it to level 4 before the end of the game, you'll get 4 points for being that far up. Alright. So that was our research action. Additionally, you can build towards your tower, and that is what you use your ore for. Research was mana, people are food, building is ore. And that is where our tower card comes in. And this is where a lot of the points are going to come from in end scoring. And what this is telling us is... And again, you have to go one step at a time. You can't jump and skip steps. If you pay one ore, you'll make it to the first level, which will gain you zero points at the end of the game. If you keep paying through the, out to the game, you know, two ore to get to level two, three ore to get to level three, all the way up, you can score up to ten points at the end of the game for having your tower built up to that point. Rest of the actions... You can quest, and that allows you to move from the edge of your territory to the edge of another territory, or really from the territory, any territory, move from the edge of one to another. So even if you're on an, an opponent's territory, you can jump from one to another. And lastly, there's patrolling, which is moving to an adjacent territory on your own area. Now, a quick aside about something that can happen after moving, and that is a war. If you move one of your cubes into a spot with another player's cube, that causes a war. And what happens with a war is this. Each player takes their cube and takes it over to their town card. And then they secretly mark how many of their resources they are willing to expend for this war. And as far as points towards the war goes, each mana or green that you spend is worth two points, each ore or red that you spend is worth one point, and each food or yellow that you spend is not worth any points. So what you do is you mark here and say, well, I am going to spend five of my resources towards this battle. And your opponent would do the same thing. They would say, well, let's say I'm going to do four. You reveal. Whoever has the most resources spent towards the battle wins. Gets to keep that territory. The loser gets their piece back into their stock. Now, there are two alternative things that could happen with a war. Let's say what happens if one player puts five towards the battle and the other person puts five towards the battle. In that case, the defender is the winner and would get to keep the territory. Additionally, the players have the option to select zero. And what that means is that they want an alliance. They want peace. If by some chance both players decide they want zero, that they want peace, both people get to stay on that spot and they have an alliance for now. And they both get to collect resources off of that land if a resource taking turn comes up. However, if e either of these players 
decides to have a war with each other, either there or anywhere else, then the alliance is broken, and a war starts out right there just as it did originally. So those are the actions that we have to choose from. Again, every turn, once one is used, it is marked off and is not available again until all have been used. And then at that point, it's cleared off and you start again. Okay, so how do you know when the game is over? The game is over when a player completes one of these things. Either all seven of their cubes are out on the map somewhere. A player has built all the way to the top on the tower up to the sixth spot. Or lastly, they have reached the upper level in magic on their faction card. When that happens, the game continues again until all of our action cubes have been used. And then at that point, the game is over. The players add up their score, and whoever has the most points wins. Okay, so building Tiny Epic Kingdom should be super easy. All we have are two pages of cards that are printed out on cardstock and a bunch of cubes. We have four different colors of cubes for player cubes, some resource cubes, and some cubes for action markers. Now a word on the cubes. Uh, a lot of people are stuck on using wooden cubes. That seems to be what's traditional in a lot of games. Uh, but I decided to go with plastic, and there's a couple of reasons for that, one of which is economics. These things are super cheap to buy in bulk. Uh, I believe I got, it's been a while since I bought these, but I believe it was probably about 12 bucks for a thousand cubes in various colors. And that's amazingly cheaper than buying wood. And also just the variety of colors that you can get is more than you may ever need. So it's it's really unless you're super stuck on wood, I would really recommend these. And the way you find these is they're not sold as gaming cubes. These are educational tools. They're called centimeter counting cubes. They're used for teaching kids how to count and stuff like that. But there's a tip there. If you're interested in getting a good deal on cubes and you're okay with plastic, go ahead and look for that. But just a moment, let me get these out of the way and we'll start cutting our cards. Now I'm going to be using my guillotine cutter again, and I went ahead and on these cards drew out some crop marks from the center of the cards out to try and make it a little bit easier to line up. Now again, I'm not real trusting of my printer printing perfectly straight, so I am going to eyeball the line on here against the edge rather than using the guide that's at the top of the cutter. I'm just going to take this and give it a slice that looks straight. Another one here. Just lop off a bit of the top of that. And I totally forgot to put crop marks here, so I think I'll put this aside for a moment and take care of that later. So these aren't going to be completely done on this page. But I'll go ahead and get done what we have here.
and then we'll pause for a second to move on to step two. Okay, now to finish my cards complete with the crop lines that I forgot before. <laughs> to finish off the ones from the first page that I forgot to crop correctly and now we have lines so I can see a little bit better where I need to cut at. And yeah that's pretty much it. About the only thing left that you might want to do uh, is if you're a stickler about these corners here they do make a punch for that and you can see I'm not sure how well the camera is going to pick that up but you can kind of see the black line in there where they drew it and it doesn't quite line up exactly but it's probably going to be close enough let's give this a quick punch and you can see we've got a rounded corner there so if we do this on all four corners we've got a rounded card and it doesn't quite match up with the lines as good as it could so you know you may want to decide is it better to have that kind of a little wonky like that or is it better to have the curved drawing there but have square corners uh, also depending on what you want to do with the cards you know this is just thick paper you may want to laminate these or mount them or put them in sleeves or something like that for now, I think I'm just going to leave them on the cardstock. I think that's fine. Once we get all of those punched, just arrange all our cards together. And again, since this is a pretty tiny game, I went ahead and I got a VHS tape box. All I need to do is open her up, put our cards in there, put our cubes in there and again our booklet form instructions printed out give it a close and we've got our completed tiny epic kingdoms game in a tiny VHS box